P-R-O-T-O-C-O-L-S of the Synagogue of Satan world for many years I have contended that while the information contained in the so-called protocols of the learned elders of Zion does contain verification of the existence of a conspiracy to destroy all remaining governments and religions, as exposed by Professor John Robeson in 1797, gives an account of how the plan has progressed since and tells what remains to be done to enable those who direct the conspiracy at the top to reach their final objective, which is absolute world domination. I still maintain that the protocols, original plans are, not those of the learned elders of Zion. I know that, sticking to my guns, in regard to this matter, is going to provide a double-edged sword that the enemies of God will use to discredit what I have written. One edge of that sword will be used by anti-Semites, who will accuse me of having communist sympathies. The other edge will be used by Satanists to try to convince those who would wish to read my works that I am Semitic. So be it. I am going to tell the truth as I see it. To you, my readers, I will explain how I reached the opinion that the protocols are not, I repeat, are not, those of the elders of Zion, but those of the synagogue of Satan, which is a very different matter. One or more of the elders of Zion can be Satanists they probably are but that does not prove the protocols are a Jewish plot designed to win world domination. The fact that Judas was a traitor does not prove that all Jews are traitors. The further fact that certain Jews have, and still do belong to the synagogue of Satan, and to revolutionary and subversive movements, doesn't make them a race apart. The synagogue of Satan always has, since Judaism started, contained so-called Khazar Jews, as well as Gentiles. Since September 1914, I have enjoyed the friendship of a man who is one of Britain's greatest scholars and intelligence officers. He is one of the world's finest linguists. He has done postgraduate and research work concerning geopolitical science, economics, comparative religions, etc., in most of the old universities throughout the world. He has been decorated by the British government and by most of her allies, including the USA in both world wars, for special services efficiently rendered. When World War II broke out, all these honors proved rather embarrassing, because when he and I resumed to naval service in 1939, he had to usurp from his uniform the ribbons of medals given him by nations with whom we were allied in the First World War. Several of them were now our enemies. Special service has taken my friend all over the world, and involved him in political intrigue. He made a thorough study of the protocols shortly after Nihilus first published them as The Jewish Peril in Russia in 1905. Serving in Russia as an intelligence officer both before World War I and during the Russian Revolution, the Mensheviks and afterwards, the Bolsheviks, offered a higher reward for his capture, dead or alive, than for any other foreign agent during the years 1916 to 1918. My wife and I spent our delayed honeymoon with my friend and his wife, a Russian lady he married and helped to escape from Russia early in 1918. His ability to translate so many languages provided me with a great deal of information I could not possibly have obtained if it had not been for our close association over the years. Having had access to his private papers, I am under promise that I will not reveal his identity or write his biography till after his death. The officer to whom I refer knows more about the origin of the protocols and how they fell into the hands of Professor Nihilus than any other living man. He knew Nihilus when he lived in Russia. He knew Marsden and his wife when they lived in Russia before and during the revolution. I share that knowledge with him. Also, at my request, 
the son of a high-ranking Russian officer, who was one of the greatest leaders of the White Russian movement, check the information and conclusions I have published regarding the protocols since 1930, and he agrees with my writings. Serving in British submarines in 1916 to 1919 as navigating officer, I knew Commander E. N. Kramy, who died in 1917 holding back the revolutionary mob which tried to break into the British consulate in St. Petersburg, now Petrograd. The leaders of the mob wanted to get secret and confidential documents they knew my friend had placed in the consulate. Kramy held the mob back with small arms until his associates had burned the documents. He was repeatedly wounded and so severely that he died on the steps of the embassy. I know what information the leaders of the Mensheviks wish to obtain so badly. My friend's wife is godmother to one of my children, and I have discussed many times with her Russia and Russian affairs. She read my manuscripts dealing with this phase of the WRM before they were published, as did her husband. Victor Marsden translated Nihilus' book, the Jewish Peril into English, and published it under the misleading title, The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. I met him in 1927 when he was touring the world as public relations officer with the then Prince of Wales, now the Duke of Windsor. Victor Marsden lived in Russia before the revolution as a correspondent for the London Morning Post. He married a Russian lady. When the revolution started the Mensheviks threw Marsden into prison on suspicion that he was a spy. While he was in St. Peter and Paul prison he was treated brutally, so much so that his heart became filled with hatred for the Mensheviks, most of whom were Jews. Page 73 Satan, Prince of this world Victor Marsden was physically ill and mentally disturbed when he translated the copy of Professor Nihilus' Jewish Peril into English. The copy from which he worked was in the British Museum, having been received by the librarian there in August, 1906. Marsden was in such poor health when he did his work in 1920 that he couldn't work more than an hour without taking the rest. He rarely worked more than two hours a day. But in 1921 he published his translation of Nihilus' book in English under the title, The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. Because of his experiences in prison, it seemed impossible to convince him that those who directed the world revolutionary movement at the very top were using Jews to serve their own diabolical purposes, as whipping boys upon whose shoulders they placed the blame for their sins against God and their crimes against humanity. My friend told both Professor Nihilus and Victor Marsden the true story of the Protocols as he told it to me. I have published the story in Pawns in the Game. A brief outline will place readers who haven't read the other books in a better position to understand what I am going to say about this much-discussed publication. When Pike established councils of his new and reformed Paladian right in the principal cities throughout the world, he gave definite instructions that the members of those councils were to organize women's auxiliaries, to be known as lodges or councils of adoption. These women were carefully chosen from the higher levels of society in their respective countries. They are still active. In England in World War I high society women, belonging to the London Council of Adoption of the Paladian Rite, acted as hostesses to officers on leave from various theatres of war, at the Glass Club. They included wives and daughters of Britain's nobility and members of Britain's government. These women entertained the officers invited to the club while they were on leave. During this period they remained masked, so the officer they entertained would not recognize them. Most of their photos appeared frequently in society publications. The information they picked up was all passed to the supervising directorate of the Paladian Propaganda and Intelligence Service. In 1885, or thereabouts, 
a series of lectures was prepared for deliver to the members of the Grand Orient Lodges and Councils of the Paladian Rite. Those who prepared these lectures did so in a manner that allowed the hearer to know just as much as was necessary to permit him to contribute his share towards furthering the WRM, intelligently, without letting him penetrate the full secret that it is the intention of the high priests of the Lucifer Ian Creed to usurp world power in the final stage of the revolution. If Pike did not prepare these lectures personally, he most certainly inspired them. The limiting of knowledge to adepts in the lower degrees, deceiving them into believing their objectives are other than is really intended, and by keeping the identity of those who belong to the higher degrees absolutely secret from those even one degree lower than they, is the principle on which the heads of the synagogue of Satan base their security. It is this policy which enabled them to withhold their secret even from men like Mazzini and Lemmy, leaders of the WRM, until the high priest decides they might be initiated into the full secret. In studying the lectures we must also remember that those who prepared them were literally members of the SOS. We must therefore look for words with double meaning, and phrases which are intended to deceive. Word by word, sentence by sentence, study of this horrible document reveals many double meaning words and deceptive phrases. Those who prepared the lectures knew it was almost impossible to prevent copies falling into hands other than those intended. This they knew from experience in 1784-1786. So extraordinary precautions were taken to make sure that if the contents of these lectures became known, people other than themselves and the Polydian right would be blamed. I have explained these things to the Britain's Publishing Society, which has published the English edition of the Protocols since Marsden's death. I pointed out that, according to Pike's own written instruction, the word, God, was to be used when the word, Lucifer, was intended. When the synagogue of Satan plotted Christ's death, and accomplished that foul purpose, they stayed in the background and worked from the dark. They hired Judas to carry out the betrayal, and then made the Jews assume the blame for their sin against God and their crime against humanity. It is the adepts of the Grand Orient and the Paladian Rite who glory in the celebration of the Adonaiside Mass, and, as we shall prove by study of the lectures, those who prepared them for delivery don't care if they sacrifice two-thirds of the world's population in order to reach their final objective and impose a Luciferian totalitarian dictatorship upon what is left of the human race. Those who prepared the lectures served the father of lies. They were masters of the seed. Knowing this, we must be alert if we wish to penetrate through to the truth. Contrary to popular belief, Nihilus was not the first person to publish the contents of these lectures. I pointed this out to the publishers many years ago. Now the 81st impression of the so-called Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion has been given the much more realistic title, World Conquest Through World Government. I also noticed that the publisher admits, in this new edition, that Nihilus wasn't the first to publish the documents. Page 74 Satan, Prince of this World as mentioned in another chapter, the series of lectures had first been published in the winter of 1902-1903 in Russian in a newspaper named Moskowski Jawido Mosti, and began in the same language, in August and September of 1903 in a newspaper called Snamja. These publications didn't have the desired effect, failing to cause a rise in anti-Semitism, as the directors of the WRM expected would happen in Russia. The SOS wanted to use anti-Semitism to enable them to foment the revolutions which would lead to the overthrow of the power of the Tsars as required by Pike's military blueprint of wars and revolutions. Professor Nihilus was a priest of the Russian Orthodox Church. 
my friend thought him honest and sincere in his belief that the world revolutionary movement was a Jewish plot. There can be no gainsaying the fact that Khazar Jews headed the revolutionary movements in Russia. They filled the ranks of the revolutionary underground armies. Lesser Jews had been taught from childhood to hate their Gentile rulers, and to believe that they were being persecuted because of their religion. This was a lie. The fact remains that Nihilus knew of Weishaupt, the Illuminati, and Pike and his Paladian right. Only Nihilus, and his maker, know whether he was one of those priests who wore wolves dressed in sheep's clothing. When Nihilus published the lectures as part of his book, The Great and the Little in 1905, and said it exposed the Jewish peril, he set the world on fire. Intentionally or otherwise, he gave birth to anti-Semitism as the SOS intended, so they could use it to foment World Wars I and II and bring about the Russian Revolution, as required to further their plot. My information about Nihilus' part in the publication of the Protocols was published in 1955 in Pawns in the Game. Since then, I have learned considerably more about this remarkable man. He told three different stories to three different people, when asked to explain how the lectures first came into his possession. That is not characteristic of an honest man. As an ordained priest he was supposed to have been working to serve God's purpose. As such, he would tell the truth. The truth regarding the protocols is as follows. There's evidence to indicate that the lectures were being delivered to Grand Orient Masons and members of Pike's Paladian Rite all over the world from 1885 onwards. When first published in Russia in 1902, they were said to be minutes of a meeting held by the elders of Zion that was so obviously a lie to anyone who took the trouble to read the material carefully. Nihilus covered up this he by saying, the material is a report with parts apparently missing, made by some powerful person, my friend says, and I agree, that the series of lectures were inspired or written by Pike. The wording and phraseology are almost, if not absolutely identical with his other writings. They were delivered over a period of three or more days and nights. The first of the series explains Weishaupt's revision and modernization of the protocols of the Luciferian conspiracy. The second of the series describes the progress which the conspiracy had made since 1776. The third and final series of the lectures tell what remains to be done, and how Pike intended it should be accomplished, to reach the final goal of a one-world government during the 20th century. Professor Nihilus is on record as saying, Apparently there is a lecture, or part of a lecture missing. The part that is missing is the final lecture, reserved for those being initiated into the full secret that the high priests of the Luciferian creed intend to usurp the powers of the first world government, regardless of how, or by whom, it is established. It would be interesting to know what Professor Nihilus would have answered if he had been asked, How do you know that a part of a lecture is missing? It is things like this that alert research workers to the true facts. We ask ourselves, if Nihilus lied regarding how he came into possession of the documents, and if he claims there is a part missing, it is reasonable to suppose he was an adept of the Paladian Rite, and knew the full secret if he wasn't, it isn't likely he would know that some is missing. Nihilus admitted that it was impossible for him to produce written or oral proof of the authenticity of the document. On the other hand, when all the loose ends are tied together, we get a clear picture of the continuing Luciferian conspiracy, how it is directed by the SOS not the Jews, and its ultimate purpose. We see that the WRM is directed the VERYTOP by the SOS, which in turn is controlled by the high priests of the Luciferian creed. When Kerensky formed Russia's first provisional government, he ordered all copies of Nihilus' book to be destroyed. 
This made it appear more than ever that the Jews were trying to cover up his exposure. After Lenin usurped power and put Kerensky out of business, the Cheka imprisoned Nihilus. He was exiled and died in Vladimir January 13, 1929. According to one story Nihilus told, and the one of the three which appears nearest to the truth, the documents he received, translated and published, were stolen by a woman of easy virtue from a high-degree mason who spent a night with her after completing his engagement as lecturer to the members of the higher degrees of the Grand Orient Masonry in Paris, France. This sounds like a plausible explanation. But let us examine it in detail. What mason who has been tested and tried, until judged suitable for initiation into the highest degree of Grand Orient Masonry, and or the new and reformed Paladian Rite would be so careless as to take top secret and incriminating documents with him, page 75 Satan, prince of this world into the apartment of a woman of easy virtue? That he would do so just do as it makes sense. Had the documents been stolen, the Illuminati would have used their wealth power and influence, and the millions of pairs of eyes they control, to get them back. Investigating every angle of the mystery of the missing documents, my friend reached the conclusion that they were given to a lady high in French society who also happened to be a member of the Lodge of Adoption attached to the Paris Council of the Paladian Rite. Evidence indicated that the man who gave the documents to this lady was one of the highest and most influential Grand Orient Masons in France, and was undoubtedly a member of Pike's new and reformed Paladian Rite. The lady in question was undoubtedly instructed to whom she should entrust the documents so they would get into the hands of those who directed the anti-Semitic movement in Russia. By telling this Russian nobleman that the documents had been stolen from a Jew who was a high-degree Mason, it was thought to deceive him into believing the woman's motives were pure and that no intrigue and deceit were involved. These deductions explain also how the documents first were given to one newspaper and then to another. It was not until after publication had failed to produce the anti-Semitic reaction that the original or another copy was placed in the hands of Professor Satan. Nihilism produced the desired result. I know for it positive fact copies of Nihilus Jewish peril were placed in the possession of every prominent Russian who was attached to the imperial household and employed by the Tsar in any kind of executive capacity. Copies were placed on the bureaus of ladies, in waiting in their rooms within the imperial palace. Revolutionary activities had divided Russian society into two groups, those who were loyal to the Tsar, and those who were not. Publication, and widespread circulation, of the documents under the title The Jewish Peril undoubtedly enabled those who directed the Russian revolutionary movement, from behind the scenes to develop their plot and further their secret plans. One of them was the international banker, Jacob Schiff of New York, USA, whose revolutionary leader was Trotsky. Working with Schiff to bring about the subjugation of Russia was the Warburg family of Hamburg, Germany. The members of this banking house were closely connected with and on exceptionally friendly terms with Gerson Blecker Oder, who was director of Pike's supervisory council of the Paladian Rite in Berlin. The secret headquarters of those fomenting the Russian Revolution in Germany was the big building on Valentin's Kampstrasse where Armand Levi had established the secret Jewish Federation, which became known as the Sovereign Patriarchal Council backed by the Rothschilds millions. Strange as it may seem but as additional proof that the SOS does not consist of Orthodox Jews, but of them who say they are Jews, and are not, and thus lie, we find that Lenin was being coached to take over leadership of the revolutionary war in Russia by none other than Lemmy who had succeeded Mazzini as Pike's director of political action.
Lemney had set up his headquarters near Geneva, Switzerland. Thus we see how the lectures inspired by Pike were made to appear to be a conspiracy of Jews to win world domination. This charge the real Jews bitterly resented. But when we've cleared away all confusing aspects of the case, the TRUTII stands out clear and unmistakable. The version of the lectures placed in the hands of Professor Nihilus was used to help those who direct the WRM at the top to foment the Russian revolutions of 1905 and 1917, and thus put Pike's plans into effect exactly as he intended. Marsden explains the meaning of the word, goyim to be, Gentiles or non-Jews. With this I cannot agree. The word, goyim, meant originally, the masses of or the common people, but as the word was used by Weishaupt, its meaning changed to, lesser beings the mob. Pike used the word to mean, human cattle. The whole of humanity whom he said was to be integrated into a mass of mongrelized humanity, an enslaved body, mind and soul. The word, agent your, is also used frequently in the lectures. Marston says the word means, the whole body of agents and agencies made use of by the elders, of Zion, whether members of the, tribe, or their Gentile, tools. With this explanation, I must disagree also. The word agent your, as used in the protocols, means, every member of society the synagogue of Satan control and used to put the Luciferian conspiracy into effect, and keep it progressing towards its ultimate goal, regardless of race, color or creed. The words, the political, are said by Marsden to mean not exactly the, body politic, but the entire machinery of politics. With this definition, I do agree. It must be clearly understood that I believe the PROTOCOLS are those of the synagogue of Satan. The copy given Nihilus was altered slightly to make believe they are those of the elders of Zion, so that those who direct the conspiracy at the top could use both Zionism and anti-Semitism to further their own secret plans to cause revolution in Russia. Protocol number one is nothing more or less than a reiteration of Weishaupt's principles. A that in the beginnings of the structure of society mankind was subjected to brutal and blind force, afterwards to law, which is exactly the same force disguised. This being so, page 76 Satan, prince of this world, the principle of, the law of nature, is that, right, lies in force, or, to put it in other words, might is right. Pike secretly endorsed this principle. Be political freedom is an idea, not a fact. But those plotting to obtain absolute control of the masses must use this idea as a bait to attract the masses to one of their parties, organizations, so they can be used for crushing those at present in authority and thus remove obstacles which stand between the SOS and ultimate world domination. See so-called, liberalism is to be used to soften up rulers so that for the sake of the, idea of freedom and, liberalism they will yield some of their power. The lecturer then remarks, it is precisely here that the triumph of theory appears. He explains that those who plot to subjugate the rest must gather up the slack reins of government into their own hands, because the blind might of any nation cannot for one single day exist without guidance, and thus the new usurped authority will fit into the place of the old. What happened in France before the lectures were given, and what has happened in Russia, Germany, China, and is happening in England today, typically illustrates how this phase of the conspiracy has been put into effect. D. First, the emperors, crowned kings and sovereign rulers must be disposed of by assassination, revolution or other means. Then the natural, or genealogical aristocracy shall be destroyed in a revolutionary reign of terror. The lecturer explains how the conspirators will replace the power of the rulers they destroy with the power of gold, 
and replace the genealogical aristocracy with people of wealth whose fortunes the conspirators control. In other words, those who create the new aristocracy of wealth can make those they wish to use wealthy, and they can just as easily break those who refuse to do their bidding. It is interesting to note that most of those who now form the aristocracy of wealth got their start promoting rackets of one kind or another, which separated gullible people from their hard-earned money. The Rothschilds got their feet on the lower rungs of the ladder of fortune by providing the British government with Hessian soldiers at so much a head. Thus they were well paid for providing troops to fight Britain's colonial wars, which they, the Rothschild family, had fomented. The Morgan fortune was founded on the sale of arms and ammunition to the Confederate Army, which arms and ammunition had previously been condemned by the federal authorities. The Rockefeller fortune was founded upon ethical quackery and the sale of patent medicines. The newly rich we find in the luxury resorts of southern Florida and the Caribbean are mostly axe racketeers, while a goodly number have not as yet qualified to have the X put before the word racketeer. Bootleggers and professional gamblers now form the crust of modern society. This illustrates how Weishaupt's and Pike's plans have replaced the genealogical aristocracy with an aristocracy of wealth, gold, whom the SOS control body, mind, and soul through control of their bank books. E. The lecture goes on to point out that when states become exhausted by involvement in external wars or revolutions, the conspirators use the despotism of capitalism which is entirely in the hands of those directing the conspiracy. He says the exhausted states must accept the financial help and advice of those who plotted to destroy them, or go under completely. This explains how the national debts have been foisted upon the remaining nations and how republics have been financed since Weishaupt's day. F. The lecture then says the word, right, is an abstract thought and proved by nothing. The word means, give me what I want that thereby I may prove that I am stronger than you. He explains that the power of those who direct the conspiracy will become more invincible as they develop the tottering conditions of rulers and governments because their existence will remain invisible. He then informs his hearers that out of the temporary evil and chaos which they are compelled to commit will emerge good government in the form of an absolute dictatorship because, without an absolute despotism, there can be no existence for civilization which is carried on not by the masses, democracy, but by their guide. May I point out that the word, democracy as applied to republics and limited monarchies, was introduced by those who direct the conspiracy at the instigation of Voltaire, in order to deceive the masses into believing that they ruled their countries after the overthrow of their monarchs and aristocracy. The masses have elected those whom the directors of the W.R.M. selected to run for office. But the agent you're of the SOS, using Luminous and agent you're, have governed from behind the scenes always since absolute. Page 77 Satan, prince of this world monarchs ceased to exist. The biggest lie the SOS ever foisted on the public is the belief that communism is a workers' movement designed to destroy capitalism in order to introduce socialist governments which can then be formed into an international of Soviet, working men's, republics and a classless world. The lie must be apparent to any reasonable person who stops to think. As has been proved by documentary evidence and historical data in puns in the game, Red Fog Over America and this book, capitalists have organized, financed, directed, and then had their agents take over the powers of governor earnment in every country subjugated to date. It costs up to hundreds of millions of dollars to finance revolutions such as took place in Russia and China. The preparation period in both countries extended over more than 50 years. 
we ask the workers where they think the money comes from to pay the cost of reconstruction necessary to repair and replace the ravages of war and build up the economies of the so-called republics. National debts repaid through taxation is one source of the wealth of the SOS. It is time we took the blinders from our eyes so we can see clearly. The truth is that those who direct the WRM at the top, call them the SOS or the Illuminati, or what you wish, control gold, and gold controls every aspect of the world revolutionary movement. It is the men who control gold, the men we commonly refer to as capitalists, who finance, direct, and control all revolutionary efforts in order that they may lead the masses, go yum, out of their present oppressions, into new and complete subjection to totalitarian dictatorship. The reader will do well to remember that God is an absolute God. He requires that absolute obedience be given willingly and voluntarily. Lucifer also will rule as an absolute king for all eternity. The word, democracy actually means mob rule, and because it does, the lecturer proceeds to inform his fellow conspirators that the idea of freedom is impossible of realization, because no one knows how to use it with moderation. He said, it is enough to hand over a people to self-government for a short time for them to turn themselves into a disorganized mob. Internal strife then reduces them to a heap of ashes. This is what is intended to happen in the remaining so-called free nations. Considering the fact that these words were uttered half a century ago, they have proved exceptionally true. They prove the devilish cunning and diabolical knowledge the SOS have regarding the weaknesses of human nature. The lecturer then tells his audience, the mob is a savage, and displays its savagery at every opportunity. The moment the mob seizes freedom in its hands, it quickly turns to anarchy, which is the highest degree of savagery. Gee, the lecturer then explains how, since Cromwell's day, the Goyim, masses of the people human cattle, are being reduced to one common level. My friend, A.K. Chesterton, editor of Candor, doesn't agree with me that since Weishaupt and Pike took over, the word, Goyim, means, human cattle, but the fact remains that chapter 1, par, 22 of Marsden's translation of the protocols says, Behold the alcoholized animals, bemused with drink, the right to the immoderate use of which comes along with freedom. It is not for us and ours to walk that road. The people of the Goyim are bemused with alcoholic liquors, supplied by our agents. Their youth have grown stupid on classicism and from early immorality, into which it has been inducted by our special agents by tutors, lackeys, governesses in the houses of the wealthy, by clerks and by others, by our women and in the places of dissipation frequented by the Goyim. In the number of these last I count the so-called society ladies, voluntarily followers of the others in corruption and luxury. Does this not prove we are being reduced to the level of human cattle? Can any reasonable person deny that society as a whole is being reduced to one common level of iniquity? This is really what class war means. God's plan enable his creatures to progress by personal application to the highest levels of spiritual attainment. It is possible for a human soul to reach the seventh heaven, and, according to some theologians, even fill the seats left vacant by Lucifer and his defecting angels. The Luciferian ideology requires that all human beings be dragged down to one common level in sin, corruption, vice, and misery. H. The lectures then explain that the Illuminati and Polydians must play a game of force and make-believe. Force must be used to obtain political control and make-believe to obtain control of governments which do not want to lay down their crowns at the feet of some new power. The lecturer says, this evil is the one and only means to attain our end, 
which is good therefore we must not stop at briber as deceit or treachery when they can be page 78 i the first lecture ends with an explanation of how the illuminated ones have deceived the goyim into delivering themselves into their hands the lecturer says far back in ancient times we were the first to cry among the masses goyim the words liberty equality fraternity words repeated many times since those days by human parrots who from all sides flew down upon these baits and with them carried away the well-being of the world true freedom of the individual formerly so well guarded against pressure of the mob satan prince of this world used to serve our purpose in politics one must know how to seize the property of others without hesitation if by it we secure submission and sovereignty. What has the creation and pyramiding of the national debts done since the 1700s? What are income and corporation tax and so-called luxury and other taxes doing today? How much of our earnings is left for our own use after those who direct the financial policy of the polity and right get through with us? By controlling the policy of our governments, they are taxing us into economic slavery. By giving land lease in the name of charity, the SOS uses our money to control communism until they foment the final social cataclysm. The lecturer then gloats over the fact that even the wisest men among the Goyim, even those who consider themselves intellectuals could not make anything out of the uttered words in their abstractness, and did not note the contradiction of their meaning and interrelation. He points out that in nature there is no equality and there can be no freedom, because nature has established inequality of minds and characters and capacities, just as immutably as nature has established subordination to her laws. He then explains how from the very beginning those who direct the conspiracy at the top have contravened God's law of dynastic rule under which a father passed on to his son knowledge of the course of political affairs in such wise that none could know it but the dynasty, and none could betray it to the governed. The lecturer then points out that as time went on the meaning of dynastic transference of the true position of affairs in the political was lost and this law aided the success of their cause. See Pike's Dogma Re, Nature, elsewhere in this book. Thus the lecturer proved that what I said about the conspiracy in the previous chapters is true. What he said proves that the protocols were not drawn up by the learned elders of Zion for the information of those who attended the Zionist Congress at Basel, Switzerland in August, 1903, as has been claimed by those selected to lead the anti-Semitic phase of the Luciferian conspiracy, but that the conspiracy anti-dates twice helped. The synagogue of Satan, which Christ exposed, goes back the other than the days of Solomon. It goes back to the time when Satan first caused our first parents to defect from God for the purpose of preventing or putting his plan for the rule of the universe into operation on this earth. Thus the SOS, by directing the Luciferian conspiracy on this earth, prevents our doing God's will here as it is done in heaven. The lecturer winds up his initial address with a boast. He says, the deceptive slogan of liberty, equality and fraternity brought to our ranks whole legions who bore our banners with enthusiasm, while, all the time, those very words were a canker worm boring into the well-being of the Goyim, putting an end to peace, quiet, solidarity, and destroying the very foundations of our Goya states. He then lets his hearers into the first secret. He tells them the triumph of the conspiracy to achieve world domination to date, between 1885 and 1901, was due to the fact that when they came across a person they wished to control and use to serve their purpose, they always worked upon the most sensitive chords of his or her mind, upon the cash account, upon their cupidity, upon their insatiability for material needs and each one of their human weaknesses which, even when taken alone, is sufficient to paralyze initiative.
because it hands over the pool of men to the disposal of those who by their activities. Thus we see how the conspirators, working through their agent Yor, have been able to convince the mob that their government is nothing but the steward of the people, who are the owners of the country, and that the steward may be replaced by the people like a worn-out glove. Don't feel badly. I myself was fooled into that belief. It was 1950 before I began to suspect the truth, that, as the lecturer put it, it is his possibility of replacing the representatives of the people frequently which has enabled those who direct the conspiracy at the top to gradually obtain control of all candidates for political office. Nothing has impressed this truth upon my mind more than the more recent general, federal elections in Britain, Canada, and the USA today the people really have Hobson's choice page 79 Satan Prince of this